Great stuff. So we should be live now, Alex. Cool. So, huh. Yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm delighted today to be joined by my guest, Alexander Wills, a digital print expert and co-founder of Fashion Formula and Make Home. A big welcome, Alex. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. No problem. And here at Make It In Design, we've had the absolute pleasure of collaborating with you for several years now. Um, it's flown by, hasn't it? Yeah, it's probably been about, I think, about six or seven years now. Yeah. Been, which and, has been great. And every time I speak to you, I learn something new. You absolutely know all there is to know, I think, for me. Well, we're, I try, <laughs> try and keep on top of things. I the mean, it, it's still very much a growing uh, side of uh, the textile market but uh, it's always very exciting in what we do so yeah but you as a designer getting your work printed and out there into the world it's both an investment financially and time wise and it can feel really daunting I think but the amazing work that you and your team do means that as designers we don't it takes that stress out of it doesn't it yeah I mean that's kind of one of the reasons we um we set up the business in the first place so it was all about um, making things a lot easier uh, for people to uh, basically create their own designs, get them out into the public and either, you know, sell sell their designs or to make something from what they've got. So, yeah. And so for the next 45 minutes, we're going to be discussing with you what we need to know about digital print for design. You've got some great top tips for us. Um, and we're also going to discuss how you've come on board with the Live Hub this quarter um, with our new trend theme of high summer. Um, so it's going to be a great session. Um, but just before we get stuck in, I'm going to ask people joining the session now if they can post in the comments where in the world they're joining us from um, so that we can say a quick hello. So I'm just going to have a look at those comments, Alex. Sure. I have to just swap screens, I'm afraid. <laughs> so please do pop in the comments where you're joining us from. Um, we'll also have some time towards the end of the session for questions for Alex as well. Um, so let's really make the most of having his time today. Um, so we've got Pauline joining us from London. Um, hi, Pauline. We've got Maggie joining us from Dublin. Um, we've got Caroline also joining us from sunny UK. It is really sunny in the UK. Well, it is for me in Leeds. How about you, Alex, in London? It's nice and bright today, thankfully. Oh, good. No rain. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Brilliant. We've got Lynn joining us from Scotland. Um, Raka also joining us here in the UK. And Raka's actually going to do a live session with us next week as well. So thanks for joining, Raka. Um, we've got Beth from Richmond, Virginia, um, Sue joining us from Pennsylvania, um, we've got Jill from the Netherlands, um, Natasha also from Stroud in the UK. Um, so yeah, lots of lovely faces is joining us in today's session. Um, so Alex, can you tell our audience a little bit about your background and the work you do, please? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Alex uh, and uh, I'm a founder of um, company called Fashion Formula. We're actually rebranding to make in the next couple of months as well. So you'll kind of see that coming through. Um, we uh, sustainably digitally print onto fabric. So uh, we specialize in sustainable digital printing for fashion and interior brands. Uh, anyone from the likes of people, uh, including Alexander McQueen, Burberry and ASOS uh, down to um, kind of your local uh, designer maker or, or designer. Um, I have uh, 19 years experience in uh, all eight types of digital textile printing and have probably worked with over around 10,000 uh, small and medium sized businesses over my career. Amazing. And you've got, I mean, you've, like you just said, you've worked with businesses from all different scales as well. And mm. I know um, you've got some impressive case studies as well. And I know you've got a few on your PDF today. Um, you've got some claims to fame, haven't you, as well? <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, I mean, I, I've i worked, I can't even tell you how many, I've forgotten probably half <laughs> of the projects I worked on. I mean, one of the projects I worked on many, many years ago, um, we produced about, so my uh, previous company produced about um, about a third of the flags and banners for the Olympic Games in 2012. 
which was a, a fun operation. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, high fashion designers, as I mentioned, um, but also it's for me, it's very exciting not only to see stuff on the on the catwalks, but also to work with uh, smaller brands and smaller designers and see how they can grow. Um, and kind of one of our real ethos of the business is really uh, to be a, to becoming kind of like a partner for uh, designers and for um, and for businesses. So kind of more an extension of, of your company and, and your brand. And I mean, you've definitely been so supportive of Make It In Design and our community over the years. And I know that many of our community and Rachel herself comes to you um, to get her designs printed. Um, and it's just a big part for a designer, isn't it? And I know you're going to now speak to us about how that starts, you know, how that, that journey takes Mm -hmm. um, evolves really um because it is a big step isn't it for a designer it is yeah i mean it's it's always exciting i think to kind of get your get your kind of designs out into the world you know it's always that that trepidatious moment where you've mm -hmm. you've designed something in private and you've created these creations that you think are wonderful and then it's kind of taking that step to seeing i guess for public acceptance and and finding you know your crowd or your specific people who love your designs and I think that's always a kind of exciting and nervous part for a designer. Yeah and it's now I mean over the years it's become more and more the case that designers don't wait for a client um, or a brand to print their work they take the reins themselves don't they and get it printed whether that's to, to show off at a trade show in your portfolio or if you're um, selling your own products. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, there's a little bit of a bit of a power switch mm -hmm. happening where, you know, previously, maybe 20 years ago now, uh, kind of before the invention of digital textile printing, you know, getting designs out into the world was such a costly and time laborious process that actually it was very difficult for small designers and independent artists to kind of get their work out there. Um, but with the invention of digital textile printing and uh, a lot of things like e-commerce and social media, um, you find that actually the, the smaller designers are getting chased by um, the big companies who are almost, I mean, in some very sad events, copying work. But, you know, the, it's, um, it's given a lot of power to uh, the small designer in terms of getting their work out there and getting it seen. Um, and, that is, you know, it's kind of, again, quite exciting for designers in that sense. And I know you're going to discuss this when you um, take us through your presentation, but the turnaround is really fast, fast as well, isn't it, fashion formula? Yeah, I mean, actually, when you, you know, when you talk about print studios and things like that, I mean, this is a, a big selling point uh, for especially the service that we offer. And we offer um, specific services for print studios. Uh, where we can actually turn around prints and that might be 50, 100 metres worth of fabric in four to six hours, um, which means, you know, if they are getting a collection, say during the fashion weeks, um, you know, they might get some inspiration from somebody, put out a collection, and then the next day they're taking it to, to a, you know, people like H&M or um, all these kind of brands. So you can be really, really responsive and that speed actually, you know, I had a, a print studio, quite a well-known one, say, you know, the other week, actually, that the speed that we turn things around for them uh, had made a massive difference um, in terms of what they can do and how quickly they can show clients and, you know, effectively grasp sales. So. Yeah. And so that it's a really powerful tool for designers to tap into, isn't it? And I know you and your team make it really accessible um, for designers to come to you and get samples and mm -hmm. you know, you're there to offer advice on what fabrics they should use and all the technical side. And I yeah. know you're going to give us a little bit of an insight into that today. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll try and go through um, some kind of uh, some basic steps. And then I think on Thursday, um, yeah. Uh, we, I'm giving a, a second talk, which I'll go through in, in much more detail as well in terms of what we're we're kind of doing. Yeah, so we've been really fortunate for we we've just opened the doors to our members only club, which is the Life Hub, 
and we've been really fortunate Alex to get you on board this quarter to come and speak with our members and pass on some of the expertise and get them print and manufacture ready I guess and get them yeah, making so money from the work or I think I think that's the main idea yeah you know. <laughs> Um, so yeah you're doing this session um, with everybody today but just to let people know that if you are a live hub member or you want to join us Alex is doing um, an exclusive session for live hub members um, this Thursday coming um, so Alex do you want to move on to your presentation is that okay sure absolutely Brilliant. okay so just give me a minute to uh, to share no screen worries. I'll just read some comments actually while we're So let me know when you can see the screen. Yeah, that's all good. Cool. You want to you want to read some comments first, or yeah, I... just um, we've got someone we've got one of our um, members called Lindsay, and she used to work for Burberry actually, so she was pretty oh. impressed with you there. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, so we've got lots of um people loving what you were saying about the brands you've been working and then working with smaller businesses. So that's great. So I'll let you go on to the presentation, Alex. Sure. OK, so uh, as you've probably gathered by now, uh, well, I uh, I start co-founded uh, Fashion Formula with uh, my partner Artemis um, about seven years ago now. Um, and we are effectively an on-demand digital textile printer. Um, so I'll take you through. I'm not sure how how well this slides through, so I'll, I'll try and figure this one out. Yeah. Um, here we go. <laughs> Uh, so about us, we started in 2015 and kind of uh, the reason why we started um, was I, I, I'd, I'd been doing this previously for about 10, 11 years. Um, and uh, we I, I saw that there was there's kind of a gap in the market where a lot of smaller designers or people who were kind of being wanted to be creative were really struggling because there wasn't really. Um, a good kind of online portal where people could upload their designs, create things almost like a kind of moon pick for fabric and wallpaper um, around. It was always very complicated. You know, you had to send in lots of details. You had to go in through lots of proofing samples, had to go through an art worker and just made things very, very timely, complicated and effectively also a little bit more expensive as well. Um, so about seven years ago, we we created uh, this platform not only where um, designers can kind of upload their own designs, um, but also uh, a place where designers could create their own shops and upload their designs and earn a commission on anything that they sold onto, say fabric, wallpaper, cushions, tea towels, aprons, and kind of the range is growing on that. Um, so let me go. So I've got a, I'm not sure whether it'll play. No didn't want to play oh. <laughs> um let's see. we can link to that afterwards no. i didn't want to play unfortunately <laughs> sorry but there was a little video but i, I can i can always put a, a link into facebook oh, yeah. later so you can have a little look at it thank you um okay so i mean a little bit more about what we do here uh we print onto uh textiles as i mentioned wallpapers and murals uh, and we also have um design uh a design side to our business as well. So just to go a little bit further into that, in the textile side, um, we uh, have a specific focus on sustainable fabrics. So probably out of the 95 fabrics that we stock on our website, and these are base fabrics that you can upload a design and print onto, uh, I would say about 40 to 45 of them are sustainable bases, whether that's recycled or eco. And we are looking to uh, bring in another probably maybe 15 to 20 this year or swap out our regular bases with organic or recycle bases as well. Um, I think by my last judgment, I think we had about 40 to 50 percent more sustainable bases than any other textile printer, at least I know in the UK. Um, so, I mean, it's something that we're very, very passionate about. Um, and again, on the wallpapers and murals. Um, it's uh, yeah, pretty standard wallpapers there. Yep. Um, so let's just see. So I mean, the the question is, you know, where do you see digital textile printing being? And this is probably a question that you kind of 
you don't think about because yes you might you might think about the kind of the regular things so things like soft furnishings and fashion um but there are so many different places that you can use uh digital textile printing so these are kind of some of the I'm just going to run you through quickly some of the uh, places where you might sit. So things like cushions, upholstery, lampshades. Um, again, I don't think my videos are working, but these are <laughs> um, these were some videos of some upholstery projects so on the left um, is uh, from Reloved Upholstery, who I know you guys yeah, uh, work yeah. with, with Simeon. Uh, and on the right is um, another designer called uh, Natalie Allen as well. Um, and they have, uh, so our fabrics get used anything from kind of domestic upholstery all the way through to contract FR. So at the moment I'm working on about six or seven different hotel projects. Um, so this is where we will actually specify fabrics and work with uh, architects and designers um, to put specific uh, fabrics into places. This, you know, our, our fabrics have ended up in places like Soho House um, and a number of other fairly high, high profile uh, projects as well. So this is something that we offer a little bit on the side of what we do for our, our traditional thing. Um, and then another side uh, where a lot of startup designers uh, will end up doing is uh, more sort of homemade products. So whether they'll uh, print a few meters and then make them into um, products that will sell on, say, Etsy and Craftsy, Amazon, um, maybe in local markets. So this is always a, a nice place to have designers uh, sell their prints uh, and a way for you, know, you to earn a, a living off having some of your prints out there and also for you to get exposure for your designs. Um, and that's where really the, the upload um, function on our website really comes into its own so people can kind of upload they can store their library online and then just order as they need uh, and as i said we make if you if you're not a sewer as well we make products so things like tea towels cushions aprons uh, blankets all that kind of stuff as well um, and then obviously fabric by the meter um, for basically whatever use you want um, and then, so you think maybe where it ends up, so it might end up in fashion, so things like swimwear fabrics, uh, saris, we do. One thing that's very interesting uh, for digital, um, and as a designer, uh, you can really embrace with digital, is um, placement or engineered prints. So whether that being um, for, if you know, if you're making a bag, actually printing the shape of the bag, and having a specific uh, location for your design so that it fits together um, or going as far as some of the very high fashion brands that we work with they'll engineer whole entire dresses so things like the design will run all the way through the seam on the shoulder down the arm you know into the neck piece um, and I mean this that takes a little bit of skill but again uh, these are all things that you can do with digital that you can't really do with screen because the screens either aren't big enough or there's just too much of a complicated job to do. Um, and again, these are some of maybe some of the, the fashion brands that we've worked with over the years. Uh, I don't I, I think these are probably a little bit older ones, but we've uh, we've you know, we're always working with new brands every so all the time. Uh, this is a kind of fun project that we worked with. So this is uh, for a designer to see. Um, as a designer, you can see all the way from sketch through to actual production. Uh, so this was a project with a designer called Mary Katranzu uh, for, um, I think this was for a gig of Beyonce's down, uh, the Nelson Mandela gig down in, um, I think it was South Africa a few years ago. And so you can see here the sketch uh, with the design um, and then it actually coming into, coming through our production. So being printed, and this was uh, printed on a specialty sequin fabric. And then here's the final end uh, use of it. So it's quite exciting to sort of see the different projects and see where they go to. And honestly, I probably only know about 3% of where all of our prints <laughs> go. <goes. laughs> I try and keep on track with some stuff, but I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of impossible really 
on that's that a great example isn't it on its own <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And then you've got kind of wallpapers and murals, so where you can see uh, wallpapers and designs uh, coming up. Uh, and again, is a really nice way for uh, designers to kind of show their prints. Uh, and again, this was one of our designers um, for uh, I think I think an an Italian icon, Chiara Ferragni. Um, and that I think we did we did her bathroom for her again a few years ago. So. Oh, that kind of got us some nice exposure. And then this is a this was kind of a fun one and something to think about as a designer is the combination of fashion and homewares. So actually, this was actually another project that we did for Mary Catranzo. Uh, and this was for her her um, kids' baptism. And we actually printed dress kind of garments uh, or fabric for, for dresses. And then also things like chair covers, tablecloths, all this kind of thing for it was an amazing looking event as well so really stunning um so how is this beautiful print created um and i think this is where probably the designers i, I mean i i'm personally not a designer uh i i'm i dropped art at about 13 14 so <laughs> although i spend my life on photoshop i uh, i don't have any formal training um, but I always think that, you know, inspiration is kind of drawn from everywhere. It's drawn from your experiences, even, you know, in a dark room, seeing light and shades against a wall. Um, you know, the, all these kind of things can kind of inspire you. So, I mean, as an artist, I would always, you know, I would always, you know, look at lots of other designers, try and get to museums, because you never know what really kind of sparks your intrigue. And even just going out for a walk in the evening. You know, you see something, you might see a lovely pattern, a lovely shape or or a, an animal in, and you get really inspired by it. So, uh, as I said, I, I don't have formal training, but I'm sure the artists among us will uh, will be able to probably share a little bit more light about their ideas and creations. <laughs> um, and yeah, so from design all the way to uh, production. Um, so this is kind of an, a really nice example, actually, was on the final of The Apprentice. Uh, a few years ago, um, where we had um, Sean come in and basically she had about three or four hours to come up with something entirely original, um, design it, paint it on a piece of paper. We then scanned it in, redrew it in Photoshop, uh, it then got sent to our printers, it got printed and she was out the door in about three hours and printed onto about 30 metres of Lycra. Um, so I think that kind of highlighted the the real the speed of what how you can design and get things from idea to uh, to product very very quickly, which for me is very exciting. And actually, that was uh, again replicated. We did the Apprentice again in the final in 2022, um, and here's an example of uh, the print coming through one of our machines, and then uh, the final garment made up, made from it for. Uh, for sale. Um, so again, this was a designing. This, to be honest, was not uh, my my finest moment on designing. Uh, but as I said, I'm not I'm not a formal designer. So, <laughs> um, so I mean, the I think the probably the last thing I'm going to say about the printing side is uh, in terms of design. Um, so I think one of the the beauties of uh, digital textile printing is it kind of kind of gives you a lot of freedom. So, you know, in the old days or sort of pre-digital days, shall we say, I mean, screen printing is still very much around. So, uh, you know, it, it's, still, it's still a good thing to learn, especially understanding the kind of concepts and basics behind it, because a lot of these are transferred over into digital. So even creating digital screens. Um, but, you know, screen printing generally is, can be, you know, it's very, very tricky. It's very, very skilled. In terms of what it needs, you've got limitations on the size of the roller, the number of colors, the scale, but also the minimum runs. So, you know, as a small designer, you're very, very limited in terms of what you can achieve without having, you know, a huge bank account uh, and probably quite a bit of skill uh, to kind of make it work. And that's where kind of digital uh, kind of really um, kind of turn the page for kind of small designers and starters. Uh, is that you can you know design a file and you can print it within five minutes. 
Um, you know, we we do a lot of things like color matching on site for um, in, especially interior brands. Um, so, I mean, one project I mean, at the moment, uh, I am recoloring and re redesigning 170 designs on two different bases. Wow. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's one project, but it's, uh, you know, it takes time. And one of the nice things is that we can put it, you know, if we're working on a particularly tricky design that we can't get done off strike offs, we can do a set of strike offs, see it on the machine, see how it prints, adjust the colors in Photoshop and then rerun it again um almost within the next two or three minutes so we can kind of work through and a step-by-step process um to design things um very quickly uh and also you know you you don't have any limits on colors or size of design um we regularly print prints that might be 15 20 meters long maybe for banners or long table runners or cloths or maybe theater backdrops things like that um, there's also no limit on meterage on the other side. So, for instance, we could print 10 centimeters for you. Um, and again, that kind of opens up the options in terms of, you know, what, what a designer wants. But also, if you just want to sample things, we offer 20 by 20 centimeter samples where you can actually, um, you know, upload your design and try, try designs maybe on uh, different scales or maybe try it on different types of fabric to see how the fabric prints. Uh, and of course, that leads to total creativity and obviously a low investment. I mean, things like the samples, they're only two pounds a sample. So which really makes it very accessible for pretty much anybody uh, yeah. to start creating their own things. OK, so I mean, this is just an example of um, a, a digital printing machine. But effectively, the digital printing machines are um, like big desktop printers. So. Um, you're going to have uh, the print heads uh, going over the fabric. The fabric is uh, normally held on, especially in, in this example, onto um, effectively a conveyor belt that's sticky. So the fabric gets stuck to the belt. The print heads go over it, put down a layer of ink, and then um, the print moves across a little bit. The print head comes across, and then it keeps moving like that onwards. Uh, so the print's built up over layers of, uh, of print from these print heads. Uh, and then obviously you've got pre-treatment and post-treatment after that. So it might be washing, fixation. Um, you might have softening finishes, um, lots of different finishing uh, within. But at least this is the example of the printing. Um, I mean, these are a couple of uh, examples. So for instance, this is uh, Lycra for bodysuits that have been printed using designs. Uh, this is one of our, the designers, actually, uh, I think an alumni of Make It In Design. She is, yeah, Rachel. Rachel, who, uh, so this is printing, I think on the, the middle one is our linen, uh, the bottom one is our satin in the right hand, top one is, I think, our velvet. So she's got her, some of her designs on our site as well. Um, but she's always lovely and colourful. And she's probably, probably one of the first designers I, I properly started chatting with as well when we started the company. Um, so I think this is probably what you've, you guys have been waiting a little bit for. So some of my top tips for designing. And I, as I said, I will go into more detail um, in the Live Hub event on Thursday as well, in terms of um, what we kind of uh, do. But um, I think the first uh, top tip to really think about is um, to find the format that you want to design in and set your files properly. So whether this be Illustrator, Photoshop, uh, Procreate, um, you know, to set up the file uh, in mind for printing high resolution. So when you're starting the design uh, to make sure it's um, the canvas is sufficiently large, especially if it's in Photoshop and Illustrator, it doesn't matter so much because it's vectorized. But in Photoshop, to make sure the canvas is sufficiently large that if you wanted to blow the design up, that you're working at a scale that if you blow it up, you're not going to lose all the definition on the actual design uh, by the time you do it. Because you can always shrink the design, but you have limitations on blowing a design up because it starts uh, reinterpolating the, the artwork and putting little pictures. Basically, Photoshop guesses what pixel should go where. So you get kind of artifacts in the design. 
Um, so within this, best best practice is to set the color mode, uh, to set the, by that it means um, maybe sRGB color mode or a specific CMYK color mode. Um, and then the color space, so that's kind of uh, the printing space. And again, most popular is normally um, sRGB or Adobe, I think it's 1998, which are the, the two main ones for RGB. Um, I can't remember exactly the, the CMYK one, but I think it's swap version two, which was a normally a popular one on Photoshop. Uh, but we, we run an RGB um, for our designs because uh, for us at least, uh, screens are RGB and not CMYK. So CMYK is much more prevalent for people who are doing traditional presses where you're, you're trying to match the colors on the actual product itself. Um, but especially because people are designing on their screens for us, um, that we find that when when you're designing, if you design in RGB, you're going to get a, a good match to the screen. Um, our, our printers actually don't print in either CMYK or RGB. Um, so we have a, a piece of software called a RIP or raster image processor, which effectively converts the designs or the artworks, uh, whether it be CMYK or RGB, into uh, it splits them out into the eight channels for the printers um, to effectively lay down the colors, a bit like screen printing. So it splits them into the eight screens. Um, and then obviously uh, an important one is DPI. So I would I would recommend never design under 150 DPI. Probably best if you if your computer can handle it, design at 300 DPI, because again you can always scale down. So we always recommend for printing to submit at 150 DPI. For us, uh, going higher doesn't really make a huge amount of difference when you're printing onto fabric. Printing onto wallpaper or anything where you smooth and you've got a really, you need a really sharp, clean edge, um, then 300 DPI can sometimes give you an edge. But to be honest, the trade off on performance on your computer and everything else uh, is not necessarily worth it. So I, I always think um, at least submitting into at 150 DPI. Uh, is is good enough for printing onto fabric. Um, another thing to really think about is really designing for your medium. So as I said, you know, we've got wallpaper, we've got lots of different fabrics. And within these fabrics, you've got a huge amount of different mediums. So you've got, you might have a voile or a georgette or a chiffon, something that's very transparent. It's going to let, let a lot of light through. So you will lose some of the definition. So maybe you want to make the design more contrasty um, or more bold uh, to kind of see that design if you want. Um, or if you're printing onto maybe an organic uh, canvas, so we have things like organic Panama or organic drill, so kind of heavier ones that maybe have a beige or a natural background that will, will take away some of the colors. So if, you, if you're designing a white bay or a white print, you have to bear in mind that that color is going to come through the design. So it's not going to print white because you can't print white onto the fabric. So effectively, where you've got white is going to be a beige or a, a darker shade. So again, you've got to kind of think about that. Um, and then also, also the um, when, when you're designing, you've got to think about um, kind of who, who you want to be the end user as well and kind of where that's going. So if you're designing for wallpaper, you might want to think about designing something that works at a really big scale. Uh, if you're designing, we, you know, we produce a lot of uh, products for things like dog collars, where you, the designs, you know, it's really, really small. It might be only an inch high. So you want a design that's maybe not too busy at that point. And, you know, it's just gonna be some motifs or a particular, sh you know, gradients and things like that that work well in such a small, uh, environment. So again, just considering, even if you don't really know where it's going to go, just thinking about these kind of things uh, always, is always good uh, in terms of working out the balance of how your design is um, and how you want it to be kind of structured. Because obviously, as well, you got to think that the size of the design will change the impact of certain colors. So for instance, if you've got a single motif, um, say a dark motif on say a yellow background and you make it really really big um and it's just a, a like a repeating brick motif if it's made as wallpaper the wallpaper is going to look very very yellow 
But if it's shrunk down really small, your the print will actually look quite dark because the yellow is not then the dominant color. The maybe the dark, the dark shade is going to be more prevalent uh, as it gets smaller. So you've again got to think about how colors look at the different scales as well, which is again something I mean you don't always particularly think about, but uh, again it, it's something. So you can you can always play around with it on Photoshop and see how that works. Um, my personal thing is to try and avoid uh, very repetitive designs, so kind of tram lining of designs. Um, and if you do want to, you, you kind of want to make it really, really obvious. And it's kind of, a, I guess it, it, it's something that especially a lot of um, kind of junior designers fall into uh, in terms of creating a design that looks very, very samey, very monotonous. Um, and it is, it, it can look very nice if done well, you know, if you've got particular squares or a certain motif, but sometimes it looks like the designer hasn't given enough thought into how the design is structured. So always using things like maybe putting a, a, a half drop or a half step or a different repeat in it, or just throwing a few different elements in maybe some artifacts within the background to kind of take away the monotony of the design or to draw the eye away from that kind of repetitiveness. Um, again, a lot of especially, you know, university students will use things like mirror design um, for artworks because they don't have particularly the skill maybe to put it into repeat. Um, that's, that's quite a nice tactic if you get the mirror right and you kind of make it work. Um, but again, it's kind of the same thing as the repetitive design. You need to kind of make it work with the right colors. And again, you can kind of play around in Photoshop we're trying to trying to mirror it so you can just you know um, for instance in photoshop you can just create the tile then um, create a canvas 200 percent to the right uh, duplicate the tile or sorry duplicate the tile first then create a, a second layer enlarge the canvas and then kind of flip it over using a horizontal flip to give you an idea of how the mirror will look um sorry i've been talking a lot <laughs> <laughs> you deserve a break <laughs> Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, after that, I would say once you've got the design and you're happy with it, always save the original artwork in a vector or an uncompressed image file, like a TIFF. Please, please never, never save, if you can avoid it, if you've got space on your computer, never save as a JPEG or a PNG for your original artwork. I would always, the way that we, that we work at Fashion Formula, especially when I'm doing design, and custom design for people is we have um, specific folders. So we will work with, we'll have the original file. So when a client, for instance, sends us the original file, we'll take the original file. Uh, we'll then have a working versions file of this. So uh, this might be where we've got color amends and we'll version them. So version one version. So depends how we're running it, but if we're running like the especially like multiples will do like test one and they might have test one version one version two version three version four then we've printed it and we've seen it and then it starts to test two version one version two version three version four etc so you're creating all these um versions which allow you to kind of come back to where you were um on one particular thing and you kind of want to always have the original file in case there's any corruption um working through the versions and then when you've got your final file you save it as a final file and name it final. So don't just save your working file as the final file. Always have your working file and then save an alternate final file. Um, because if that corrupts or something goes wrong with the save, then you've always got the working one to re resave it again. Um, and again, if you accidentally save it as a low res version or a JPEG or a, you know something else, when you're when you're playing around with it, then again, you've got those original files to work through and you've got that kind of workflow and that thought process behind it, um, which kind of helps you uh, to kind of set things up. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, the, these these are kind of, again, probably covered a little bit more in, on my on my chat on Thursday. Um, really valuable advice about naming the files, though. Thank you. Yeah. Original. Yeah, I mean, I know I have so many people who uh, come into our office 
uh, with their computer and they'll kind of, um, you know, if they've made a meeting and they're kind of going through their artwork and they're, they're sifting through their artwork and they're kind of going, oh, it's not this file, it's not this file, no, it's not this file. And they've given them like totally random names. The, the clearer and the more organized you can be with your filing and your artwork, even save them into collections, save them into, you know, even if it's months, you know, January, February, March, whatever you want to do. Just keep it, the, the more organized you can have your file structures to save your files and your artwork and your designs, the easier it's going to be to actually work with your files and to have a, a common structure there um, when you're actually doing. Uh, the next thing I would always say is once you've saved the file is always sample before commissioning a print run. Um, even if you're 100 percent, you know, confident, uh, you know, we're, we're very, very confident that our colors uh, get very, very close to most people's screens, as long as they've got it, you know, as long as they've not done something silly with the screens and um, in terms of the brightness and contrast and stuff, you know, we we aim to effectively match our prints to screen. So um, that being said, there are so many fabrics that print so differently. They take the inks differently. You know, our cottons and our synthetic bases will print entirely differently because they're within with different ink sets. You know, when when you're talking about you might print on something which maybe has a slightly higher lycra content or a nylon which prints maybe slightly green because that's how a nylon base will print. Um, so it's always very important to um, sample your designs before commissioning a print run just to make sure that you're happy. It's a very inexpensive process and it saves a lot of disappointment down the line. And also you get to pick up on any glitches. So, you know, if you've left a pixel line around the design, uh, which is probably our most, most uh, commonly happening thing um, to designers. And we, we actually have a, we have a link on our website with some tutorials of how to remove the white pixel line that happens most often when, uh, people who are working in Illustrator will save the file. And um, I can't remember the exact, it's either you turn on or off anti-aliasing. You have to check on the, the thing, but basically what happens is that when you save it from an Illustrator file to say a PDF or a TIFF or export it, if you've got the anti-aliasing on or off, um, it will put a shadow, like a, a shadow feathered pixel around the edge of the design. Um, that means that when you actually repeat it, you get that kind of, it's it's kind of hard to see when you upload it to the website because it's just one pixel wide. And also it's a, it's like a half tone of whatever you've created. Um, but basically it adds that line. And then when it gets printed, you obviously have square grid lines in your print, which is, uh, you know, highly disappointing. So it's always, it's always wise to, to sample that. Um, and it also allows you to check colors and scale and things like that as well. Um, okay. Uh, before I think, let's, uh, before I go on, does anybody maybe have any questions? Uh, we've not got any questions just yet, but if anybody does have any questions, feel free to start popping them in. Yeah, pop, pop them in and then I'll, I'll maybe take some questions after the next slide as well. And I yeah. Hope... yeah, we've um, got lots of love for for Shan on The Apprentice, though. Lots of people remember seeing that. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> OK, so what I would say is my um, tips for a new designer, um, or uh, any designer, really. Um, sorry, I'm sorry, have a glass of water before I get going. Um, it's getting hot in here now, in London, so it's, it's all good. <laughs> Um, okay, so one of the main things is to uh, never forget your own brand and style, which I think is going to be a starting point for anyone who's kind of learning, you're not learning, but getting out and doing their own print and getting their designs out in the world. Or you might be, you know, already an established designer, um, but really it, it's about kind of getting your your style out there. And with with all the best designers that, you know, I know and work with, um, you can almost pinpoint their design. I don't even have to be told whose design's coming through on the machines that day because I already know that that style is 99% likely to be that particular designer. And I think establishing a style is, is much about your 
your brand as well and your brand as a specific designer as an illustrator gives you recognition but also it allows you to um establish a kind of fan base for your art and i know it sounds like a funny thing but you know everyone's attracted to different types of art and different types of style and design you know we'll you know we print let's let's say for instance baby wear and we print uh, a lot of different uh, types of jersey for lots of different kind of kids wear brands and um we've got designers who might have who specialize in alternative designs so very kind of gothic and punk designs for kids wear you've got very cutesy designs you've got very bright kind of more typical you know things like fun designs like tractors and all that kind of stuff you've got some very artistic you know kind of more I would say more highbrow, high high end kind of designs, uh, and then you've got kind of people who just kind of follow follow trends and kind of hit maybe some of the trends like retro and stuff like that as well. But again, with these designers, they all have a quite a, a typical style, and I think kind of developing your style will allow you to really um, to reach out to an audience and create an audience and find people who really love your stuff and then you can have you know you have conversations with them you have and you, you kind of grow from there and then they effectively buy into your design brand and you know when you start selling or creating uh products out of it they're going to be the first people to actually buy it because they already love your designs and they're used to that style so i, I think that's something that's that people don't really touch on that much um but something that's quite key uh and then i mean the second one um, I think it goes without saying is uh, work with suppliers uh, to establish, you know, what to what you can achieve and what's possible. You know, there are a lot of there are a lot of good companies out there, um, ours included. And, you know, we we have a lot of experience in what we do. Um, so, you know, never be afraid to actually, you know, reach out to us and and ask us questions. Um, I mean, the, the only thing we can do is just not not respond to it. But, you know, it, the likelihood is, is that, you know, we will respond and take time to actually help you. And, you know, I, I always I always personally try and take a lot of time to uh, work, you know, speak with people who uh, may, you know, ask questions on our website. Uh, there's actually uh, an option uh, in the artwork services that you can actually book um, book like a 15 minute chat with me. So if you have a, a specific questions about artwork and things like that, that you can actually go on on the site and book a time in my calendar and I can actually have a little chat with you or you can just feel free to drop me or my team uh, any emails. So that's that's always something and even creating products, you know, it's always best to reach out and ask the, the manufacturers what products work best, you know, even with our suppliers. You know, or if I'm looking for a new supplier, I'll sometimes, you know, I'll turn around and go, you know, which fabrics are selling the best, which ones are, you know, really popular, because at the end of the day, it gives an indication on what's going to sell well for you and what's going to work. I mean, you know, we, we will always develop things, but at the same time, there's there's, you know, something to be said about also uh, leaning on the back of someone who's already been there, trodden the road a thousand times and has kind of been through that process um and then the next thing i i would say uh we uh look to always uh develop partnerships uh, as i said earlier um you know especially with brands uh we look to kind of be a partnership uh with you so you know really working together to create your product create your products be, um and help you find the best product for what you need uh out there um but in terms of designers you know there's no harm if you're starting out and create a little collective with a couple of other friendly designers that you might have a really nice you know really nice time with you know the very least you go for a you know a cup of tea or a gin and tonic once a month and have a chat about design and you know how how difficult it is sometimes and how amazing it is sometimes and kind of share your share your ups and downs um, but on the other side of it is, um, you know, things like skill sharing. So you might get asked as a designer, you might get asked to do a commission that you personally don't have, you know, particular skill for. You know, it might be um, 
I don't know, a design you, you've been asked to create like a Paisley or, or something that's quite specific. And maybe you have uh, a designer that you've talked to a lot and they create, you know, they create those designs and maybe they can do part, they could fulfill the commission for you. And, and you can work together to kind of create projects. I mean, it's just a different way of kind of looking at things, but also things like load sharing as well on, if you know, if you've got a, a big project as well, kind of doing collaborations with other artists. And again, it gets your exposure with different designers as well. So that side of things. Um, I mean, one thing that I think a lot of design, or quite a few designers sometimes overlook um, is that a lot of brands that we work with, maybe not so much the, the bigger, the bigger brands, but a lot of like the smaller brands that maybe that sell on Instagram or Depop or, you know, some of these or Etsy, um, they, this, a lot of them might not be designers. So they, they're looking for designs and, you know, it's, it's something that you, you can, again, as I said about creating a brand and the style, you could sell, you know, you can sell your non-exclusive, semi-exclusive print designs on things like Etsy and Instagram. Um, so you don't always have to be aiming for the big print studios as well. You know, the, even if you create different collections or uh, even I, I've seen quite a few designers create even different brand names so they don't kind of, um, should we say, uh, dilute their, their style. So they might have a certain style, but then they might create a brand name where they're creating non-exclusive, semi-exclusive prints that maybe sell a bit cheaper, but you can sell, you know, instead of, selling one design for 300 pounds or 400 pounds uh you might sell that that design 40 times for 10 pounds um you know so and people will use them in different ways and and uh and even you know things like creating designs that can be sold for people to print off at home and this kind of thing as well um but again you know that's an avenue if you want to go down about the how much you want to release your designs into the public um, and the last thing I would say as well is don't be afraid to ask your customers about what designs they want. I mean, at the end of the day, you are designing for your, I mean, you're designing for you and you're designing for your love of design and creation. But, you know, if you want to commercialize it, then, you know, you want to be reaching out to your customers, seeing what they like, you know, putting out opinion polls on Instagram, you know, kind of gauging interest into what your kind of who your raving fans uh, are and what they really love. And, and then you, again, you, this, this again goes back to kind of uh, creating more on your brand as well. Um, I, I think, yeah. Uh, okay, so does anyone have any questions at this We've point? We've got a couple of questions. Uh, cool. So let me find the first one. So MJ says, I've currently got a shop um, on Spoonflower USA and mm -hmm. I'm keen to have a similar one here in the UK so she can sell bedding and homeware sure. to UK customers. When will make be ready for designers to upload their designs and open a shop? So, um, well, make, make, is, make is up. Uh, Fashion Formula is, is up. Um, to be honest, we've had, we switched platform last year and we've had a, a few issues especially on the, the designer side uh, in terms of being able to get new designs on. Um, however, this uh, is, is we, we are working with some designers through Make Home um, where we're actually uh, kind of cherry picking some designs that we like for specific seasonal stuff. So it's a more curated um, shop. Uh, but on Fashion Formula, probably in the next two to three weeks, um, because we've got a major release coming out uh, next week um, on the site. So probably in the next two to three weeks, we'll start seeing that being able to, um, to be repopulated and kind of like new designers coming onto, coming onto the store. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been a bit sad for me because it's, you know, we, we worked so hard to get the site up and we had a, had a, a big technical issue. Um, which kind of pulled us back a little bit on that side. But uh, we rest assured we've been working really, really hard to try and get it up and running. Brilliant. It's going to be worth it, isn't it? It's very exciting. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
Um, Natasha said, is there any specific colour profile or setting to set your screen drawing pad to, or should she use a particular range of colours such as Pantone or Hex, etc.? Um, I think, uh, in so I, the drawing pad I'm assuming is you have a set number of kind of swatches or colours within the drawing pad, is that correct? Or, um, sorry, I... I I just want to know. I mean, what I would say is effectively, it, it really depends on how you like to work. Uh, we actually offer something called a color atlas, which is really helpful for designers. Um, so that is, you can effectively order one and it's order one through the website and it's two and a half thousand colors printed onto the material that you want. So obviously you can, if you want different materials, you can print them multiple color atlases. And I think it's about uh, so I think it's about 15, 18 pounds. And basically it's a meter by meter and a half sheet of all the different colors that, you know, or a decent range of colors um, with the hex codes underneath. So effectively, if you're looking to color match or create a design, you can actually use that to spot pick your colors into it. Uh, that being said, when you're actually designing digitally, um, in all honesty, I don't think it matters so much whether you're using Pantone's Rowls or just the generic Photoshop color, color dropper, um, because effectively all you're doing is you're giving a digital color. So what happens is the Pantone might be called PMS 2311, for instance, but actually all that is, is, um, you know, RG, it's, it's got a set value for RGB, which you can find elsewhere in the, the thing. So it's, if you've got Pantone charts and you're working with Pantone charts and you kind of understand how those colors are, then sure, use the Pantones. But I mean, to be honest, I don't, I don't really use the Pantones because we don't, we don't specifically match the Pantones. We match to uh, a printed sample that we print out. Um, so we use the Color Atlas quite a bit um, within projects. Brilliant. And just looking, and just looking at the tonals of everything really. Natasha said, great, and she'll order the color sample if she needs to color match. Um, Caroline's question, I think you've answered a little bit as you've been going along, but I'll just read it out. She said, is it straightforward, user friendly to use your company when new to all this? And if she has, is there somebody on hand for questions and advice and easy to follow instructions? Because some of the terms are very new to her. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we've got a we've got a customer support team um who generally answer most of the kind of the store questions um if you're uploading your own design it's super super simple you effectively go to upload your design at the at the top of the website it just opens a page you can upload it and then uh, effectively you can see a, a visualizer that puts it into repeat for you so it does so you only need to upload a tile uh, and then it puts it into repeat and you can select whether you want half drop, half step, you can change the scale and kind of play around and do all of that within the site. And then just you click on the drop down, pick the product, whether it's tea towel, apron, fabric, and then the particular fabric type you want. So it's quite straightforward. Uh, another good thing, uh, if you're ordering for yourself, a good starter is also um, we sell a sample book, uh, which is I think it's five pounds or four ninety five. Um, which is a box with uh, around 90 to 100 fabrics in it, all printed. Uh, they're around the size of an iPhone, each, each sample. Um, so you can see, and it's got the name on it, it's got color. So you can see how each fabric will take color, how it will look like, what the strength is, you know, whether it's dull, whether it's shiny. Uh, you can feel it and play, play it. And it's, it's almost like a Bible for fabrics. Um, because we've got such a wide breadth of fabrics, you know, it gives you a real, really good understanding of all the different fabrics and what they're what are, what are out there. So, what did do you say? You've got about ninety five fabrics, Alex. Yeah, we've got. I mean, we've got ninety five fabrics that we offer via the website. I think in the factory we've probably got close to around two hundred to two hundred and fifty bases. Um, because <clears throat> we have lots of we have a lot of clients, for instance, who will supply their own bases and store them with us. Yeah. Um, or we will do specific projects as well for people. So, I mean, one one of my one of my pet loves is actually researching fabrics for projects. Um, <laughs> so I, I spend I spend a lot of my time finding amazing amazing fabrics for kind of uh, development and that kind of stuff. So 
Yeah, it does sound interesting to do that. Nice part yeah. of the job. It is, absolutely. Um, one last question we've got is from Beth Rosenberg, and she said, other fabric printers, um, I lost my question then, sorry, other fabric printers using RGB have trouble printing highly saturated colours, say higher than 80% saturation on the HSL scale. Is this just a limitation on print versus screen? How do you handle highly saturated colours on your whitest bases? Um, I think, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't have issues printing highly saturated colors. I mean, actually, um, we, we specifically actually pro, so each machines have things like called something called a profile. So effectively that, uh, when, I mean, to, to get more technical, um, effectively what you do is when you start printing a new fabric or when you introduce a new fabric to the machines, you can't just start printing it uh, because effectively you need to tell the machine what the colors print like because it might be set, the, the machine basically doesn't know what colors it's putting down. So effectively what you do is you print off about, about 4,000 color chips and then we have a machine called um, uh, Spectrum Photometer which effectively is like a little machine. I, I'll, I'll try and link you. I actually took it out of my uh, slideshow, um, <laughs> but effectively it's like, a, it's like a little camera that kind of goes up and drops on each of the color chips and um, takes the colors uh, and effectively reads it. So it prints what it thinks the colors is gonna be, then reads what the color is, and then it creates this uh, something called a gamut, which is effectively or a color space. So it creates all the colors that it can achieve on the particular fabric. Um, and we focus on, uh, firstly, we, we do this for most of our fabrics. Um, so you, what that does is it gives you a uniform print. So effectively, if, if you're printing a cotton or a polyester, you should have a very similar tones and everything else across, across all the different bases. Um, but also what it does uh, is it makes sure that obviously the color balance is correct on the, when you're printing. And because we aim to go to fashion, especially the high fashion, and we work, do a lot of work with people like print studios and stuff like that, uh, we actually focus on getting really good saturation on the prints. So we have uh, very strong saturated colors on our prints. Um, so it, it's, it's something, some fabrics can come out less saturated. So for instance, some of our, for instance, uncoated cottons, when we're printing on them, they won't be as saturated because they don't have a preparation on it. Um, so the ink just sits a little bit further into the fabric. So um, it really depends. I, I can't say without knowing what printer that you've been using uh, and anything else, but feel free to drop me a message or an email um, after. And I, I'm more than happy to kind of go through and help you on that a little bit more. Brilliant. Thank you. Two more questions have snuck in, Alex. No, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Um, Sally asked, is fashion formula gonna eventually transition just to make? So if she yes. wanted to open an account, which website would she need to sign up to? She, she, wouldn't, need, she wouldn't need to worry about that, okay. Sally. You, you're right, because um, <laughs> basically uh, we already have the make.com URL live. Uh, so that just links to the fashion formula make home site. Um, uh, basically we, we were gonna switch over last year, but because of the website issues, we didn't want to do that until we were quite, you know, kind of happy with everything. Um, so with uh, Fashion Formula, effectively, all the stores will just change. So instead of it being fashionformula.com and then your URL after, it's just going to be make.com. So uh, that you won't have to do a thing. You'll just get a notification saying we're changing. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and then Raka said... Um, are you able to order a design that is just a placement print or does the tile you upload always have to be in a repeat? No, you can you can do a placement print as well. Um, so you can either select center or uh, what a lot of designers will do is because our fabrics print in in blocks, you know, so it might be a fat quarter or a meter or two meters or whatever, is that you can create a canvas that has that placement print set within. So you can design, say you're doing a meter print, you can actually do uh, a 140 by a meter canvas and set your placement prints within that. So it'll just print that particular panel. And that's 
Now, it's a really good trick for people, for instance, who are making tote bags or tea towels or cushions where they don't want the same design. So, or you want a front and a back for a cushion. So you, a lot of people, because you can get three 45 centimeter cushions to a width, um, fronts and back. So you just put the six in a block and upload that six as a, a 140 by one meter block. Um, and that way you've got a, a nice setup for your cushions as well. Brilliant. Um, sorry, there's two more questions, Alex. So I don't know if you want to do them, Mark. Um, Pauline just asked, um, what are the measurements for the sample size? I was just going to link actually to. Yeah, I mean, we have we have three. It's, it's super easy. We have three sizes, uh, 20 by 20. So roughly around an A4 size uh, piece. Uh, then we have 65 by 40, 48, which is basically a quarter of a meter. So imagine a meter of fabric and then cut into a quarter. And then uh, you've got also full linear meters. So one meters up to 10,000 meters. Brilliant. And I've just linked for Pauline to the, um, for the samples as well on Fashion Formula. And then I'll just do the last question we've got. If any more come in after that, I can collate them and, and check. Well, that's fine. I'm gonna, I've, got, I've got a few more. I'm going to talk a bit more so you can, <laughs> can come in. Um, so Jenny asks, when a designer designs for fabric, can you print at, for example, 50% opacity for certain motifs within the design? Uh, you'd have to just set that within the design. Yeah. Um, you'd, yeah, I mean... In your layers, yeah. You'd, yeah, that, I mean, that you just have to set that within the transparency of the design itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, we, I don't, I'm not entirely sure what you're looking to achieve there in terms of the opacity, because effectively, if you imagine it, if, if, it's, if you're just printing 50% opacity, you're just printing it lighter effectively. Um, because the, the, the grain will still come through and everything else will still come through the fabric. Um, and because it's fabric, it's not like it's paper where it's like it sits on top you know you got it goes into the fabric anyway so you've always got that little bit of merging of uh of colors through it anyway so if, if you want to make it more opaque more opaque uh just simply make it a little bit lighter or do the opacity and then just save the file brilliant i think we're up to date thank you for your answers to those questions alex that's been cool. great cool okay well let's see what we've got next um Oh yeah, so I was going to talk a little bit about some summer trends um, for you. Uh, so, I mean, it's always difficult for me to say. Uh, you've asked me, you guys have asked me so many times over the last six or seven years. What are the trends? <laughs> and I mean, it's funny because we we see trends that are happening before they've come out, um, because we do a lot of sampling um, work for, say, a lot of the the big high street retailers. So we'll do the, the sampling before it gets sent out to places like um, India and China for bulk production. Um, and also obviously anything coming through for, you know, the, the fashion houses and interior designers, we're gonna see the stuff before it actually gets into the public eye. Um, but then again, we're also running designs that maybe been running for three, four years for interior designers or fashion houses, you know, where we're getting into bulk production. So it's very difficult to kind of cherry pick designs because we produce for such a massive audience. Um, what I would say probably stuff that has been coming through a little bit more, um, retro 60s and 70s. So fashion probably hit about six months ago on that. Interiors is just kind of coming through a little bit now. Always tend, takes, takes about six to 12 months from fashion to interiors uh, generally, or it used to, now it's, now it's much shortened. I think it used to be 24 months. I think 18 to 24 months fashion to interiors. Now with things like digital printing uh, and you know much shorter supply chains, uh, faster lead times, uh, that that's shrunk down massively. And even a lot of people are going fashion and interiors with the same collections at the same time. Um, uh, and then you know things like light-hearted hand-drawn designs, so a little bit less. I would say almost a little bit less complete, so less polished designs. So it looks a little bit more kind of handmade, 
and they they kind of work really really nicely um and then for interiors things like moody and classical designs you know things like dark uh like thing kind of like interesting ombres with kind of like uh geometric patterns over the top um just trying to think really uh things like pet i mean we've got things like paired back design so screen print esque designs are always quite uh popular um because i think people still like the uniformity of of the print um but maybe toyed with on a larger scale or they maybe have a little quirk within them so you know you might have a, a very uniform two or three color print and then maybe there's just like one little motif within it that's maybe multicolored or something like that that kind of throws it off a little bit makes it a little bit more interesting uh fast fashion i would say at the moment it's been a lot of like hyper realistic prints so almost like photography on dresses uh i mean i've i mean i've been doing that for especially photography on dresses for like probably like 10 12 years but it <laughs> seems to be it seems to have come back a little bit especially with like the kind of depop and instagram kind of crowd um that kind of people are, are looking to kind of do that hyper realism in in fashion and then i think the last thing is kind of designs with a personality of story so the ones that work i, I find or sell well are where the designers have really gone out and sold that design you know they, they've created it but they've also kind of given a they've kind of given it a life so you know they've given it personality and a story behind it it's not just this is a design i'm selling it because i need to make some money or you know i created it one night it's like i created this because you know i we thought about this it reminded me of you know x and the colors were drawn so it's kind of you know giving people that that story which kind of goes back to creating your brand and and kind of having that um that personality behind the design really helps um so i was i was also going to say a little bit more about uh the live hub talk on thursday that i'm i'm going to give as well yeah and i was going to just say about the trends as well oh um, yeah sorry i'll go back to this first with um with the live hub this quarter is all about high summer and we've mm -hmm. got three amazing trends that Porter and Braun have given us to look at for spring, summer 24. We've got, um, let me think of them off the top of my head now. We've got Miami Beach Club, um, Summer Picnic and Sightseers. So I think in the session on Thursday, we'll probably have a look at them with you as well, Alex, and, and yep. just get your opinions on those. Yeah, as well. absolutely. And like any sort of tips on how to work, especially like something like Miami Beach Club. You can imagine yep. the colours, so... Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, I can I can definitely give a, a lot of guidance there Brilliant. on that. And then, um, yeah, so the live hub talk on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, so um, we have been uh, I've been looking at uh, developing something myself as well, which is called effectively the kind of rationalizing what we do of my experience over the last 12, 12, uh, 20, almost 20 years now as the 4D production model. Uh, method which is effectively um, how designers can kind of go about getting their designs into production so effectively define design develop and distill so I'll go through that a little bit in a little bit more de detail on Thursday um, and then also a little bit more like how 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 to work with designers how we work with them how to work with factories uh, how to set up your print submissions and kind of everything uh further assistance on how to prepare your artwork so obviously if you've got any questions and things like that fire them away uh or you know uh send send them to me so i can maybe even put them in a slide on for thursday uh and then um kind of some of the other things maybe it's i can give some help is uh, how to break into the print design industry um and how how designers can look at you know different avenues and maybe give you some ideas and inspiration on that yeah i can't wait another great session yeah uh i think we've got so that that's and um, the links on the bottom there but i'm sure that you'll have uh all the details as well and i think yeah. if you can go to facebook and and have it find that out yeah brilliant uh so yeah just a little bit about um i uh, kind of why we're interested in interesting for designers as a business uh which i know that uh one of you guys asked a question about before 
Um, so effectively, we offer designers a way uh, to avoid having to purchase and produce and stock your own products and sell them globally. Um, effectively giving you a shop where you can go on uh, or you can share with your 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 masses, as they say, and um, and people can find your designs uh, and then order them directly through us uh, onto fabric, wallpaper, tea towels, etc. Uh, and you will earn a commission on uh, each sale. Um, and the nice thing about that is that you're firstly you're not having to curate everything. We'll we'll curate um, the the products and the production. We'll handle all of that side. Uh, so effectively, all you need to do is just look after your collection, maybe tag them, name them, um, and, you know, put up your designs there. Uh, we don't, basically, we hold a non-exclusive license, which means you could use the same design and put it on, you know, another 10 or 15 sites. So uh, one of you guys mentioned Spoonflow. I mean, you know, there's a lot of designers who will have sites on Spoonflower who are now exclusively in America. And then, um, for instance, on our site, and maybe maybe someone in Europe. So you can kind of get get a, get a little bit around the different uh, geographics as well. There. Um, yeah. So that that's our side. So we've got you know a couple of uh, examples of kind of designers and maybe some stuff from what's been made. Um, and then in terms of uh, why you know why why the business is uh, interesting for customers uh, on the flip side is that we have the moment around 15,000 designs from around 750 designers um all searchable by theme and color and this is going to be a lot better in the next few weeks so just bear with us uh on that um yeah it's it's uh, one of our key improvement areas at the moment and then um one of the nice things actually in terms of the color is that our site uh, when you upload a design, will automatically pick the the top four colours um, and categorise it aut automatically uh, for you, which is kind of fun. Um, and then customers can obviously pick your design, as I mentioned, on all the different fabrics and have them delivered in normally about two to five days, uh, generally. And uh, I mean, one thing I alluded to right at the start is that we are um, we have very much a sustainability. Uh, angle in terms of what we do so uh, we we have um, no water used in our processes 95% uh, uh, energy 95% uh, reduction of energy to traditional textile printing um, but we like to go a lot further than that so actually this week we've just been uh, uh, got a the sequel um, certificate so we've got that approved which is a um, qualification for handling recycled polyester from uh, reclaimed from the sea. Um, we are in the process of uh, a number of kind of sustainability certificates as well. Uh, all, our, all, all our fabrics or majority of them are tested for EN 71 part three. So things like use for children's wear and in kids clothes um, and kids products. Uh, all our inks are Oketex approved and uh, the cotton inks are GOTS 6.0 approved as well. Um, and we have a lot of things like zero to waste processes policies as well. Uh, so we we aim to not send anything to landfill. So actually, if you want a bag of fabric, anyone, uh, you can go onto our website and you can actually order for free a bag of fabric up to 15 kilos. You, I think you can either pick it up from us in London or you can just pay for shipping either with your order. Um, and you can get a bag of uh, basically plain fabrics anything up to one to two meters worth of fabric per type across all the different fabrics. So it's quite a nice one. So we aim to try and uh, re get, get people to reuse the mm -hmm. fabrics uh, that are lost during our production processes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so here, here's another designer, I think. Um, and I, one thing I would, one last thing I would say as well, which is uh, kind of nice. So for any of the designers who are maybe established um, and are a little bit, you know, maybe you, you're working with a team or with some people. Uh, we also have uh, another company um, called Make Academy, um, which is effectively uh, designed for, set up for design led businesses, uh, normally from around two or three people to about 15 people uh, who want to grow their business. So there's a lot of, um, 
but this is more kind of uh, so looking at systems and production uh and that kind of thing and uh actually um my wife artemis who's uh our co-founder has actually written a book called designing grow uh which is out in a couple of weeks you'll have to send us the link as well so i will be sending you a link yeah. for that yeah, absolutely yeah. <laughs> That has been amazing. I, you've given us so much insight today. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully it's hopefully it's been useful for you guys. Most uh, definitely. Like we've had lots of great comments, people thanking you for being so um detailed in your explanations. Um, you've really shed a lot of light on that today. So that's, no, that's good. Amazing. I mean, if anybody wants to kind of stay up to date, I I have a. Uh, a little a little instagram account mr fabric man <laughs> which is basically me talking about fabric and exploring new kind of different things and i i explore like different uh print techniques or will be doing and kind of going through that so give me give me a follow and you can always feel free to ask me correct questions directly via direct message or the chat there as well uh, right. about anything if you have anything specific that's amazing thank you so much that's and just to repeat that, you are back with us on Thursday, just mm -hmm. for our Life Hub members, um, which is going to be great. You can't wait for that session. And then also um, just a quick reminder that this evening at 6.30, we've got one of our alumni, um, Joanne Cocker of Jojo Coco Design. She's going to do a live session with us um, talking about designing for fabric. So that's going to be really interesting on the back of this session as well. So, awesome. yeah. Um, but if anybody's got any questions um, for us or for Alex, please do feel free to reach out at learnatmakeitindesign.com. Um, I know that Kelly in the comments, thank you for doing that, Kelly, has popped the link for um, the Live Hub, which is open for signups now. Um, so if you are interested in joining us, please do have a look at that. And we look forward to seeing many of you on Thursday when we come back for another session with Alex. Awesome. Well, so I look brilliant. forward to seeing you guys uh, in a few days. Thank you so much for your time again, Alex. It's been amazing. Yeah, always. And thank you for having me on. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Cool. All right. Cheers.